Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me on this brand new episode of the show about the show. Thank you so much for being patient with me with this podcast. We have had um, we have had some um, some issues finding some guests. I am very excited about the guests that I have on joining me on this first half an hour. We I have former Minnesota Twins pitcher Jim Allum. He is going to join me and talk about his career. He played for the Twins in the 60s. He's going to share some stories from his career, and we are also going to talk about the cause that he is fighting for. Jim is also going to be a repeat guest. He is going to come back on Sunday for a special hour-long episode, but we will get into that a little bit later on. But for right now, it is Jim Allum. Jim, how you doing? Thanks for coming on. I'm fine, Devlin. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's my pleasure to talk to you. So let's talk uh, about your career. So you pitched for the Twins in uh, 1966 and 1967, but you were originally signed by the Yankees as an amateur free agent prior to the 1963 season. Talk about that. That's right. Um, I signed out of high school in 1963 with the New York Yankees. Uh, Eddie Taylor signed me. And at that time, you could basically sign with any team. And, of course, I had quite a few different teams that talked to me. But at that time, Mickey Mantle was my hero and Whitey Ford and people like that. So Mr. Taylor, when he talked to me before he signed me, he said, you know, he said, Whitey Ford should be retiring pretty soon. He said, maybe you could replace him. And I thought that was a pretty good idea. So. So, wow, he's my favorite pitcher. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be that person. And so when I signed with the Yankees, I went to Harlan, Kentucky in the Rookie League, Appalachian League. And uh, that was, you know, that's when I first started uh, professional baseball. So talk talk about kind of – talk about your experience in the Yankees and their farm system leading up to the 1960. <laughs> Sixth season when you signed with the Denver Bears. Talk about being in the Yankees farm sure. system. <clears throat> yeah, this is kind of it's actually a pretty good story because when I went to I was 17 years old when I went to Harlan, Kentucky, and uh, I knew nothing about professional baseball at all. And so when I got when I got there, I wasn't really one of the starting pitchers. They had, you know, every player there is like the best player from his state or wherever he's from. And I was very good from Washington state and supposedly, you know, the number one player from the state that year. And so I didn't get into games right away. I didn't have the right kind of baseball shoes. I didn't have the right kind of a glove. And I was from a small farm community and uh, didn't really, well, I had to get training. So anyway, the first, when I was watching the other players, Pitching, I thought they were really much better than me and some of the guys that pitched in college, and you can't compare yourself. Anyway, when I got an opportunity, and Mr. and uh, Gary Blaylock was my manager, and he'd been a pitcher uh, in an organization that actually had helped mentor Don Drysdale years before. <clears throat> anyway, what ha- one of my memorable games was I pitched against Kingsport, Tennessee. They were a Pittsburgh Pirate farm team. And I struck out 19. And a couple of the local ladies who uh, were sports writers for the Harlan newspaper uh, told me that I had tied a strikeout record set by Johnny Padres. And at that time, Johnny Padres pitched for the Dodgers. And he was also one of my very favorite pitchers. So I was pretty honored by that. So to move ahead that winter, uh, the Yankees protected me at that time on a triple a roster i think richmond and minnesota bought my contract so that put me on a in the spring training in orlando on a major league roster the 40-man roster for spring training and so i went to spring training in 1964 and i got sent out that year to bismarck in the northern league 
<clears throat> and my manager was Vern Morgan. He was a wonderful guy. And so I pitched for that? Vern that year. We also had Dave Boswell on the team. And we were good friends. And we had Andy Costco also who came over from the Detroit organization. And Andy also went to the big leagues with Minnesota. So we, you know, we had yep. some guys that went to the big leagues and in that league that year, uh, Jim Palmer pitched for uh, Aberdeen, the Baltimore farm team, along with Eddie Watt and several sure. other guys who went wow. to the big leagues. Uh, I once, I uh, was actually, it was an honor for me. I pitched against Steve Carlton in Winnipeg. I think beat him one to nothing up there. <clears throat> so I was doing well at that level. And Carlton was one of the better pitchers in that league as well. So we had quite a few guys that went on to play in the major leagues, like John Hiller with Detroit, went up to Detroit, you know, people like that. So after, so after that year in Bismarck, I went to the, uh, this is a pretty good instructional league in St. Petersburg for the Twins. And one of the guys who had signed that year out of New York, he's originally from Panama, was Rod Carew. So I was okay. with Carew and in the instructional league and a lot of people don't know it Carew actually came down it was kind of like a third baseman but he struggled mm -hmm. to catch pop-ups that were you know down the third baseline the ball spins and curves into the infield and he was having trouble catching the ball when it went way up and then they put him out at second base and I think you, you know the story after that he went to spring training I think the next year or the year after the, no, the next year. And Bernie Allen had been the second baseman for Minnesota, and we also mm -hmm. had Frank Quillacy. Anyway, Mr. Griffith let it be known that Rod Carew was going to be the second baseman, and I don't think Bernie Allen was too happy about it. But uh, And quite a few of the players weren't sure that he could be a major league player at that point. He could, you could tell that he could hit. He's kind of like Tony Oliva a little bit in his swing. You know, had good good batting skills, but his fielding, people thought maybe needed work. But he, he so he was a second baseman. And that year I went, <clears throat> the next year I went to Wilson in the Carolina League and again played for Vern Morgan. And uh, going into August – beginning of August, I was leading that league in strikeouts. I also led the Appalachian League in strikeouts, the rookie league. And then when I went to the Carolina League, at the time I got called up to Denver, I was leading that league in strikeouts at the time as well. And uh, Minnesota at that time was trying to, which they did, in 65 they got in the World Series. They were moving a lot of players around. And I was supposed to be called up to Charlotte in the Southern League, I didn't know that at the time, but they pulled guys back and forth from De Denver to Min Minnesota, and so they put me into Denver with another left-handed pitcher out of Charlotte. So then I got into Denver, and then after that, the next gen, and I, and I did well. I uh, had a shutout against Tacoma, my first Pacific Coast League win, and uh, did well. And so the next year I was at Denver again with Cal Irmer as the manager. And uh, that's the year I won 20 games in Denver. And I was the uh, professional athlete of the year for the state of Colorado that year. And the most valuable player in the Pacific Coast League. And after I'd won 20 games there and Cal Irmer was my manager, I then went to Minnesota. And my first big league start was in Yankee Stadium. And even the Mickey Mantle drove in a run off me in the first inning, and I was a little shaky because I was nervous. Earl Batty was catching. And uh, so after Mantle drove in a run, I then settled down and retired 18 in a row. So that was kind of brought me uh, – it was a good way to kind of come in. And prior to that, I would pitched a few innings in relief against Detroit, and had in, De in Detroit and had struck out Al Kaline and Norm Cash. And one of the sports writers for uh, the Minneapolis Tribune, Max Nichols, talked to me. And he said, hey, I just wanted to let you know that uh, 
Al Kaline and Norm Cash were very impressed with your skills. And I said, gee, it's very nice of them to say that. I, You know, it's quite an honor. I mean, Al Kaline was also one of my childhood heroes, though, to pitch against him actually was mm-hmm. a great honor for me. And striking him sure. out was, it, you know, that's just something you're trying to do. So, Right. Now it sounds like you know all a lot of these name these names you've listed. You know Vern Morgan, he was a coach for the Twins. Uh, you know, obviously Dave right. Boswell, he pitched for the Twins in the late '60s, early '70s. Uh, Frank Quillacy, Bernie Allen, guys like that. Um, what do you remember most about your time as a Twin? I mean, granted, you didn't you didn't you didn't play long for the Twins. You pitched. You know, you talked about the end of the '66 season, and then in 1967. You only pitched. You pitched in 21 games, 19 games as a reliever, and you know, two starts, <clears throat> and in 35 innings, um, you only had one decision. But what do you remember about kind of being a Minnesota Twin at that time? <clears throat> what what that stadium was like? What the ownership was like? What the fans were like? Right, it was pretty wonderful actually, I, and I'll tell you why because. I did go to spring training every year with the Twins from 1964 through about 69, so I actually got to know the people very well. You know, people like Bob Allison and Don Mincher and Rich Rollins and Zoilo Versalis and Tony Oliva, uh, you know, Earl Batty and Jerry Zimmerman and people like that. But when I – one fairly good memory I had is when I got called up to Minnesota from Denver – about a week later, Ron Clark and Rich Reese got called up as well, and I played ball with them. and was friendly with those guys for several years. And so sure. now Clark got called up and Reese got called up. And it, so before one of the games, Clark got to start. He was up there a few days, and he got to start in the game. So he was batting in front of Harmon. So he went to Harmon, and he said, Harmon, and what the players would do is they could do a hit and run on their own, meaning that if a runner got on first base, if we do a hit and run, which actually technically should be called a run and hit because when the pitcher throws the ball, the runner runs. So it's the hitter's obligation with the hit and run to swing at the ball, at least foul ticket, but try to hit it into right field because when the runner runs from first, it creates a big hole between first and second. And if the guy can hit it in the right field, then the runner would go around to third. So you'd have then have men on first and third. So Clark went to Harmon. He said, Harmon, if I get on first base, is there a sign you'd like to use for a hit and run? Is there something you'd like to do between us for a hit and run? And Harmon said, yeah. He said, I'll hit and you run. (laughs) Yeah. So that's it. Uh, Harmon Harmon was not a hit and run guy. He was a fifty home run a year guy, so he's, right. he wasn't getting paid to do hit and runs. Absolutely. But something that now, happened during the year with that. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, Lou Burdett, if you remember, Lou Burdett was a World Series hero, and he was pitching for. Geez, I think it was the White Sox. I'm not sure. Anyway, he was pitching in Metropolitan Stadium, and Killebrew hit, you may remember, Killebrew hit the longest home run ever hit there, and they put a plaque up on, it's in the upper deck in left field, but Luber Death threw it, it was a knuckleball, apparently, he was throwing at that time, and, and, uh, geez, we gave him a bad time, the bullpens were next to each other out in the outfield. And so we would talk to the other pitchers. And so the next day when Lou came out, someone joked, I think Jim Cott asked him, he said, how did you hold that ball that Killebrew hit up into the seat? I wanted to say, especially uh, playing for Minnesota and the organization, Mr. Griffith and Mrs. Haynes, Thelma Griffith Haynes, Joe Haynes, Sherry Robertson, uh, Tom Mee, Doc Lentz, Doc Prophet, all of the people associated with the Twins were like very wonderful, nice, great people. And Joe Haynes especially really liked me, and I really liked him. He'd pitched in the big leagues himself. 
And I, people, some people had said my curveball wasn't re, they thought wasn't really good enough. And we were in spring training, and Mr. Haynes came over to me. I was throwing on the sidelines to Earl Batty, I think, and uh, he asked me to throw a few curveballs, and I and I didn't know why, and so I did. And he said, you know, that's a good curveball. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So it's uh, so that was fine. But the uh, but Mr. Griffith, Ozzy Bluegy. All the people that ran the Twins, it was more like a family. They treated us so well. Howard Fox was a traveling secretary. And the different people that we had were just absolutely wonderful. And, you know, it was just really a pleasure to be around those guys. And, had like, Jimmy Hall was there and, yeah. you know, as a player. Yeah. So the, it, it was just great. It, so... I wanted to mention now, those guys. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And you were talking earlier about, um, you know, kind of some of the people. You talked about some of the front office people there and the clubhouse people. Um, some of some of the media. There's two media members here in Minnesota that covered um, the team back in the '60s that are actually still covering the Twins and still no. writing. Uh, Pat Royce and Sid Hartman. Sid Hartman's 90 yeah. years old. Um, he still really, lies, Sid he Hartman still lies, still was wonderful, lies. really. Yep. <clears throat> Sid Hartman was just great, and Max Nichols was there at the time, and he was really a wonderful guy. <clears throat> there was a, uh, I'm trying to think, there was a shorter guy that was really a good writer as well and wrote quite a bit, but Max was very nice about everything that he would, the comments he made and the things that he said, and and actually, all of the people in Minnesota were just wonderful. They <clears throat> they didn't boo us if we had a bad game. They were always kind and nice. And when you went shopping, they were always knew your name and just seemed to be happy with what you were trying to accomplish as a player. Now, what was the, you, you talked earlier about the hit and run, and you gave us that, that great image about Kilgore. Can you – can you talk about what it was like watching Herman Killebrew take batting practice? Well, you know, Herman was the kind of a guy that all of the players liked to watch him take batting practice. He had some, there was something in the way he was, a, of course, he was a huge, strong guy. And you may know this, but Herman was from Payette, Idaho. And I heard yeah. the story was that he delivered ice in the summertime. He's, had very strong arms and shoulders and ice, you know, then at those times was those big blocks of ice and maybe that was it. But somehow when the the ball left the bat, it would just keep carrying. And even in spring training in uh, Orlando, the uh, center field, Harmon could just almost just lift the ball up over that in spring training. For some reason, off the pitches, he could, <clears throat> he was uh, just, just had this super strength. And when I would, and there were the times that I did pitch, and maybe Harmon would play either first base or third base, because Mincher sometimes was at first or Rick Rollins at third. But Harmon was the kind of guy who would come over and say a couple of words to try and calm you down. He was almost like a uh, a manager, only uh, like a nice guy manager. Although Mr. Mealy, Sam Mealy, was a very wonderful guy. I was very friendly with Billy Martin. I just loved him, and I played for him in Denver as well. So we, you know, the coaching staff, Jim Lemon, Hal Narragon, those guys were just very nice guys. Johnny Sane, I love Johnny Sane as a pitching coach. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy and really knew pitching very well. And a guy like Jim Cott was uh, just one of the nicest, nicest people. I had a really nice friendship with Jim Perry as well. Uh, okay. Just a nice well, guy to, to hang around with. Yeah, uh, Cy Young Award winner for the Minnesota Twins in 1970. I may add, I want to say he went something like 21 and five that season. When you when you think about those those years with the Twins, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, 1965 they won the world, they went to the World Series, they got beat by the Dodgers. When you were coming into spring training in 1966, coming off of that 1965 World Series, what was the what was kind of the mindset and the what was the team's 
what was the team enthusiastic and ready to get at it? Did they know they were one of the best teams in baseball? Like, what was the what was the feeling around the team in the start of the '66 season in spring training? Well, the guys, uh, they, we knew we had a good team. I mean, actually, every position was solid, and actually, maybe to my detriment because I came up with 20 wins from the minor leagues, and I was ready. But when you have people like Jim Cotton, Jim Perry, and Jim Merritt, and Mudcat Grant, and uh, pitchers like that, uh, it's hard to break in against those guys. But I can tell you in spring training, those guys, and they played again, at Quillis, he played second, but the guys batting against Drysdale and Koufax, they didn't seem to be real confused by Drysdale, although he was a great pitcher. But Sandy Koufax actually... I think Joe Nosick or one of those guys, I heard him say one time, he said, you know, if if I could, if I would have had six strikes, I would have struck out against Koufax because he just was, his curveball was so great. His, it was explosive and it was just all business. I mean, he just didn't seem to make mistakes. And he, I mean, if you got a run off of uh, Sandy Koufax, I mean, you better not give up any because – he just wasn't going to give up very many runs. He never did. So they were, you know, they were impressed by the Dodgers, but not overly impressed. I mean, we had, you know, people like Don Mincher and Bob Allison and Harmon Killebrew and Tony Oliva and you know, uh, <clears throat> Carew coming on. I mean, they had really good players at every position. They were all really good. And at that time, you know, the American League and National League. I think there were only like eight teams in each league and they did, there were no playoffs or anything like that. So you, if you won, you won. And if you didn't, you didn't. And for example, at the end of the year in 67, when we went into uh, Boston, we had a one game lead with two, two games to play. And unfortunately we lost both Lonborg games. Yeah. Lonborg and I think Jose Santiago, I think, was one of the guys. But, you know, Cotton yeah. pitched one game. I think Dean Chance pitched the other game. And, yeah. uh, and you know, Dyskrenski had a knockout year that year. And, uh, you know, only one team can go. And and in Boston, it's – Boston, Boston, you're going to – at that time – always a lot of runs were going to be scored. That's just how it was in Boston. They just runs were produced. Absolutely. Now we got about eight, we got about eight minutes and change left, Jim. Um, you are, uh, you're one of the, one of the better um, fan friendly vintage players. I personally have sent you cards and I sent a program um, to have to be signed by you. And you were kind enough to, um, sign the cards for me. Um, what does it mean to you when fans send you stuff to be signed? <clears throat> well, I'm 73 years old. I'm pretty honored to get anything like that. And actually, I'm pretty surprised that they're still producing my baseball cards. But I, I really like to try and give back. For years in the community where I live around Everett, I coached. Uh, my two sons, actually, and other kids in the American Legion, Little League, Babe Ruth League, and so on. And recently, I try to help out the Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association. Uh, I helped in a clinic in Woodenville uh, about a month ago where we had about 100-plus children, legends of baseball, and we had kids age bracketed all the way from six years old to about 14 or 15. We had people like Jim Nettles actually was there, you know, Greg Nettles' brother, Barry Bennell, Roy yeah. Thomas, different people. And then I just helped a couple of weeks, a week or two ago in the central area of Seattle. And we had about a hundred kids, I think the same way, uh, bracketed out by age. And you know, I worked with the pitchers. And we had infielders and uh, uh, out, outfielders running, catchers, you know, different positions, and try to help the kids. And then when we get done with those clinics, we sign autographs. We give Each kid gets a baseball, and each one of us signs autographs. And then we'll have our pictures taken with them or anything that they'd like to do. And then we also have what they call kind of like a life 
life strength or life life and skills a uh, little talk after the clinic we talked to the kids as a group about you know putting in good effort and what how baseball can be so good for them and maybe about uh, you know avoiding drugs or opioids or different things that are uh, 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 you, you know Hurtful. something they shouldn't be doing yeah. you know things like sure. that just to try and help the kids and try to be an example for them and uh, and what a, and how good baseball can be to them as a person so we try to incorporate that into the clinics and I think it's a wonderful thing and it's just a kind of a way of trying to give back. For, for you know having such a, a I Absolutely. mean baseball was wonderful for me and it really helped me in many many ways and still does actually now now Jim we're wrapping up here we got about five minutes left um, okay can, can you give me a uh, Harmon Killebrew story you kind of gave me that great hit and run story <laughs> earlier can you give me another Harmon Killebrew story um well, Carmen was. I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, here's a good thing about Harmon. Uh, and you know, in a major league clubhouse, every day when you walk in the clubhouse, and this is more of a personal thing, when you go in, they usually have about, I don't know, a dozen boxes or more stacked up of baseballs. And players are required to sign the baseballs. And then, and people get a lot of, everyone gets a lot of fan mail. Harmon was the nicest, nicest man. He is a guy who would go in and you see him. He would be signing all of the baseballs. He would have fan mail. He would be answering all of the fan mail. And he was real religious about that. And and he was just, a, he was a very quiet kind of a guy. He was not a boisterous guy. He was a very confident kind of a guy. And, and he always felt confident when he was playing or batting you you just knew that uh he's the kind of guy who would he could hit home runs he was you know he was unafraid and it helps all of the other player players to also have that kind of a feeling and he was very generous with his time and he actually honored me one time he had me on his radio he had a radio show in minneapolis and had me yep. on there and talked to me and uh, it was very nice of him to do that Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you're actually um, going to be the first guest in the history of my show to be a repeat guest. You are going to be back on this Sunday. We're going to do an hour-long episode. Can you give me about a two-minute re- two preview of what we are going to chat about? Well, what we'd like to, to discuss a little bit is I'm in a group of players. <clears throat> There's 600, about 640 of us now who played – prior to 1980 and had some time in the major leagues and some of us almost four years at that time you needed four years to to uh get a major league pension now it's not that way it's much more generous now 43 days now to get a pension and so when they uh, decided on where to make the break on that it was the players prior to 1980 did not get that and the number of players we had was around 900. We're now down to a little over 600, and we're all getting older. And I'm in a group called uh, Major League Players, oh, baseball, Major League Baseball Players pre-1980, and we've had a great advocate in a, a fellow named Doug Gladstone out of New York. He's a journalist and author, and I think Doug is, agreed to come on the show as well during that time. And we'd like to kind of talk about what the conditions were when we were playing compared to how they are now. And I can also talk to you a little bit about some of the things that happened to, you know, to some of the players during the time I played and and the benefits and the inequities that that are now I mean I enjoyed baseball I loved it very much I have no problem with it at all it was wonderful for me but when I see and I and like some of my other colleagues that are in the same position I'm in some of these guys are like 10 or 12 days short of getting a major league pension and it's it merely a stipend it isn't even we do get a little money but not much and we're going to try and prevail upon the baseball community to take another look at us and see if they can't do something to help us. Many of our 
my former players are in, uh, you know, sent bankrupt, uh, not doing well. They're in ill health. They have bills or maybe they passed away uh, different things like that. And so we'd like to talk about that on Sunday and see if we can't bring a little bit of light into uh, that part of baseball. For example, when a person goes to the major leagues right now, if he plays one day, he's entitled to health care benefits for the rest of his life. If he plays 43 days, he's entitled to a major league pension, and I think it's around $30,000 a year. I know that sounds like a lot of money. It, it does to me, too, for the average person. But baseball's average salary now is a, a, a couple million dollars. I think they go in the major league minimum is five or six hundred thousand dollars for the season. So the money they're making it is astronomical, and I'm not begrudging those guys, but they need to take a look at the people like me. They're standing on our backs, basically. We're the ones that made it possible for them to be getting what they're getting right now. Absolutely. So, uh, Absolutely. Uh, so we, we, you know, we we're not ungrateful, in. but um, anyway, that's part yeah, of it. Yeah, we're going to dig into that. Uh, we're going to have an hour-long discussion, like you said, yourself, myself, and Doug. We are going to talk for an hour about the inequities of pre-1980 players. We're going to dig deep into that topic this Sunday. The time is yet to be determined. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my honor to have former Minnesota Twins player on and former big league player Jim Allen joining me for the last half an hour. Jim, I cannot tell you how much this means to me. It was a thrill for me, and thank you so much, and we will talk to you on Sunday. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure and a distinct honor for me as well. I, I thank you very much for having me on. It was fun to talk Not about some of my old friends. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll touch a little bit more on Sunday. Thanks, Jim. Take care. Yeah, thank you. All right, ladies and ladies and gentlemen, my second guest coming on is a former Major League Baseball player. He has thrown a no hitter in the Major Leagues. He is also a former Major League manager, and he, as of 2017, is the last player, the last. 17-year-old player, actually, to be to make his Major League debut. Uh, he also had his number retired by the Houston Astros in 2002. It is my honor and distinct pleasure to bring on former Major League pitcher as well as manager Larry Durker. Larry, how you doing? Thanks for joining me. I'm doing pretty well. Good, good. So let's talk a little bit about your um, about how you got started with baseball. Like I mentioned, you were uh, signed at 17 years old by the Colt 45s. You made your major league debut on your 18th birthday, and you had a pretty memorable first inning. Can you talk about that first inning of that first game? Well, uh, the part that. Uh that everybody highlights is that I struck out Willie Mays and uh, the part that uh, uh, the very first part that I remember is I walked Harvey (laughs) Keen, who was a a former batting champion. I think I threw a couple balls over his head. I was pretty pumped up and uh, Mays saw that. And then he came up a couple of hours later and I threw a slider that started out at him and he bailed and it broke over the inside part of the plate. So, I got a cold strike on him, um, and from that point on, I was lucky enough to pitch in a couple more games that year and make the team the next spring, and so I played a whole year as an 18-year-old player, another whole year as a 19-year-old player, and uh, probably, I, I, I'm i not sure, but I think they're uh, among modern pitchers, maybe – for sure, a Bob Peller, maybe Fernando Valenzuela won more games. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, you know, I won all the games before I turned 20, but I only won two games after I turned 30. So, you know, what, they, okay. what they're what sure. doing now to, to limit the pitches for players might have helped me pitch a little longer. 
Absolutely. Let's let's talk about let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, nowadays pitchers seem to you know get about 200 innings. So here was here was Larry's stats in the in the 1969 season. He was an all he was an all star. He won 20 games. He had a 2.33 ERA. He had 20 complete games, 232 strikeouts, and a whopping 305 innings. Larry, 305 innings? Wow. Yeah, and there were uh, at least six or eight guys that pitched more innings than I did that year. And uh, Tom yeah. Seaver won the, uh, the Cy Young. He was like 25 and 9 or something like that. And that was the year of the amazing bats. And so, you know, it was funny. I, if you'd look at my line that year, you'd say, well, that guy must have won the Cy Young. But there were four or five other guys uh, that finished behind Seaver and ahead of me and deserved to. And then the other amazing thing is that uh, especially down here in Texas people talk about the local pitchers uh, Nolan Ryan and Roger Clements and the the oddity that Clements won seven Cy Youngs and never pitched a no-hitter and Nolan pitched seven no-hitters and never won a Cy Young but one time I was looking at, at Nolan's career numbers and I saw all these Cy Young looking years and I said, how could he not win a Cy Young with this year? How could he not win a Cy Young in that year? And so each year that looked like a Cy Young winning year, I looked up who did win the Cy Young that year and compared his numbers to Nolan. And lo and behold, each one of those years, you could really justify those other guys having a better year than Nolan. Yeah. Yeah, and – you know, it, it, and it's funny too because I think he he still holds the record for for most strikeouts in a season. I want to say it's like three hundred and ninety three or something like that. And like you mentioned, the seven yeah, no hitters. Like and I I think he had like twenty one hitters or something. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But yeah, like you said, you know, he never won the Cy Young because there were always guys who had better seasons than he did. Well, and there were always guys that pitched for better teams than, than the, the teams he played for because he started out with the Mets and and he didn't have real good control and and they had good young pitchers and so they used him out of the bullpen a lot and he kept getting bounced back and forth between starting in the bullpen and didn't really become a, a full time starter until he was traded to the Angels. Well, when he was with the Mets, they had a pretty weak hitting team. When he got to the Angels, they had an even weaker hitting team. And then sure. he finally signed as a free agent with the Astros, and the Astros had just as weak a hitting team. They they won a division with him in the uh, rotation, but it wasn't because of their hitting. It was because of pitching speed and defense. So if you looked at uh, his career numbers and had the, one of the mathematicians uh, just – leave out the number of wins and losses and and put everything else in there, he would project a lot more wins and a lot fewer losses. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you talked about you talked about something there that was interesting. You said there were better players on better teams. Let me ask you this. Do you think that the um, Cy Young Award winner or the MVP or whatever, you know, pick a national baseball award that's given out, do you think it should be for the player that most deserves it or should it be from a player on a winning team? Because I remember, you know, years ago, that was a big thing with Alex Rodriguez. You know, he won the AL MVP in Texas, and they were a last-place team, but he hit like 57 home runs. What, what's your take on that? Should it be from a winning team or should it, should it be for the best player? I, I think it should be for the best player, but I think it's hard to separate um, a lot of times because uh, the best players in the, in the league each year uh, are, have similar seasons. And so typically the guy that, that gets seen more is the guy that plays in, all, in postseason. And so uh, – I think it's supposed to be a vote for just what they did during the regular season, but the guys that are in the race get on TV more, uh, and particularly if they're in the northeast part of the country with the New York market and Boston and Philadelphia and all, all those longtime baseball 
cities that have more than one newspaper still and a lot more TV coverage. Uh, I think that gives you a, a little bit of an edge. But sometimes, you know, when, when a guy has a season like, like Barry Bonds had, uh, whether he's in the playoffs or not, you can't ignore 73 home runs. Uh, you can't ignore yeah. an over 500 on base average. Uh, you might speculate uh, about whether he was getting some help with his hitting, but you also could speculate that the pitchers he was facing were also getting some help, and the other hitters in the league were as well. And he just completely eclipsed everyone. So, you know, right. seasons like that, you know, Ted Williams hitting 406, what he did on the last day. I think DiMaggio won the MVP that year. But there are some there there are some uh, seasons where even if the guy is not on a winning team and even if he's not in a big market, he's pretty hard to ignore. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to what you were talking about, in fact, I think the stat is Ted Williams Ted Williams uh, hit for the triple crown twice, and neither one of those years, I don't believe, he won the MVP. I think you're correct that DiMaggio won it yeah, in forty one. In, in forty one, when when he when Williams hit four oh six, DiMaggio had the fifty six game hitting streak that year. So yeah, he was probably getting a little more attention, and the Yankees probably won the the pennant. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, I don't think. I think George Brett is the only one that's come close to hitting for hitting 400 since then. So, you know, it was, it's quite yeah, an Rod accomplishment. Carew hit, Rod Carew hit 393 in 1977. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yep. there've been a couple of people chase it and nobody's caught it. Yep. Now let's talk about, let's go back to a game in 1976. You're playing in front of, 12,511 people in the Houston Astrodome, July 9th, 1976. You're on the mound, and you are facing the Montreal Expos. Talk to, tell us about that day and how special that was. Well, it was a, it's always a special day for any pitcher when you pitch a no-hitter. I, I was, uh, it helped me that uh, the Expos didn't have the the best team in the world at that time. And that particular day, Gary Carter wasn't playing. And so he was probably one of the uh, easier lineups uh, that you could face in the major leagues at that time. And so that helped a little bit. And then uh, really, I think uh, what, what was unusual about it from my point of view is that I was pretty much washed up by then. I only won about four or five games after that. And I didn't really throw very hard at that point. And uh, my breaking stuff wasn't as good. I'd gone from pitching overhand to almost sidearm because of trying to get around a, a sore shoulder. And so the last thing in the world I expected to do was pitch a no hitter. And, you know, after you do, one of the first questions somebody's going to ask you is, when did you know you had it going? And when they asked me that, I honestly said, right after the first inning, because I was walking back to the dugout thinking, I can't remember getting through the first inning without giving up a hit. So it was a gift from God, the way I look at it, because I'd had a no-hitter with two outs of the ninth, in Atlanta in 69, and I lost that on an infield hit. I had a perfect game in uh, New York. I think it was in 66 against the Mets, and the first uh, batter in the ninth hit a kind of a sinking line drive to the left, and our left fielder dove for it, and it hit his glove, but he couldn't hang on, so that was a hit. Uh, so I'd been pretty close before, but that was when I was younger and, and had some – electric stuff from time to time this time uh i was just trying to you know hit corners and change speeds and and just battle and compete and see if i could win a game and then about the seventh inning or so when i realized they still didn't have a hit i got this big jolt of adrenaline and i thought i started throwing fastballs that were sailing and if you I don't know if everybody would really 
identify with that term, but what it basically means is like a cut fastball, like Mariano Rivera threw all the time, and you see that subtle movement uh, from right to left from a right-handed uh, pitcher. And it, if you do that on a four-seam pitch, and it has a little carry, you know, a lot of backspin, let's say, it appears to run away from a right-handed hitter, and to the hitter it appears to go up. And it actually doesn't. Physics would tell you that no ball can go up, but it doesn't it doesn't descend as sharply because it's got a lot of spin. And so from a pitcher, a hitter point of view, and I've seen plenty of it myself when I was hitting, it looks like the ball hops and you swing under it. And so I got that thing going the last two innings, and that's all I threw, all fastballs, because we were in the Astrodome. I had a six-run lead, and I'd lost the one before on an infield hit, and I just thought, if I can throw it by him upstairs or get him to hit a pop fly or a fly ball, there aren't any bad bounces up there. There aren't any infield hits in the air. So I just sure. changed my frame of mind from pitching to just throwing. And that obviously worked for you. You ended up completing the game, getting the no hitter as well as the victory. Um, what your what was the reaction like when you were in the clubhouse with your teammates? I mean, obviously, you know, you've thrown a no hitter. What are they saying to you? What's your manager saying to you? What's the press saying to you? Take us through kind of what that's like in those you know in those minutes after throwing a no hitter when it's just you and your teammates and maybe the media in the locker room. Well, it, you know, I mean, there was a big, uh, you know, a, a big bunch of people jumping all over me on the field, as, as there always are. And uh, I remember that part. My manager was Bill Burden. He was a man of a very few words, and he shook my hand and said, nice game. Um, <laughs> then in the locker room, you know, <laughs> really, honestly. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the locker room, there was a, a – a TV reporter uh, who was a kind of a rookie guy, and I don't know if it was his cameraman or whether it was him, but, you know, the guys were just showering and, you know, having a beverage and getting ready to go on their way. And uh, this guy kept having trouble getting the interview with me, and I didn't start giving the interviews until after I had soaked my arm and ice. So by the time he got finished after three or four different takes, everybody was gone. And so I went up to the, the room where the families wait and my wife was there. And I said, well, it looks like everybody's gone. I guess we might as well go home. Uh, earlier that day, uh, we were painting a room in the house. Uh, I was kind of irritable, uh, as I often was on a day that I would pitch. Uh, but I remembered that I put a bottle of champagne in the refrigerator because our anniversary was coming up. And so as I started heading home, I said, well, at least we've got a bottle of champagne chilled. It may be only us, but we can celebrate. <laughs> so we did. And, you know, I was up till about five in the morning. Uh, and then you know, by the time I finally got to sleep, you know, everybody wanted to call and get an interview the next day. And that started probably about eight or nine. So I had almost no sleep. But when I woke up, I felt just as fresh as a daisy. You know, I still had, I think I was sleeping on an adrenaline rush. So I didn't need any sleep. And uh, then, you know, I did the uh, interviews in every city that we went to for the rest of the year about pitching the no-hitter. So it's, it's quite, you know, it's a big deal in a way. But in my mind, it's not uh, its not as unlikely for sure as hitting for the cycle. Um, and there is a lot of luck involved. Otherwise, Roger Clemens certainly would have pitched some no-hitters. Uh, you can have one like a Renolan pitch in Detroit where he struck out 17 guys. When you do that, only 10 guys hit the ball. There's a good chance you might pitch a no-hitter. In that game, by the way, Norm Cash came up uh, last time he came up. Uh, he walked to the plate with a piano leg. 
And uh, <laughs> the umpire made him go back and get a bat. And he said, why? I can't hit it anyway. So, you know, he was kind of a character. But if you get that sure. kind of a no-hitter, you got a pretty pretty good chance. And and I had a pretty good chance, too. The last, in the last two innings, I struck out four of the six guys. So that, that certainly helps your odds. But uh, then you're going to have another no-hitter like Ken Holtzman pitched for the Cubs early in the year at Wrigley Field with a cold wind blowing straight in. And he uh, pitched a no-hitter without striking out anybody. Now, what are the chances of that? 27 balls right. hit and no yeah. infield hit, no blue pit, uh, you yeah. know, no, nothing that flares over and lands on the foul line. So yeah. there was a lot of luck in that one. And yeah, because of that, you know, the actual no hitter that I pitched, I would say would be pretty far down the list of the best games that I pitched where I did give up hits. But I got lucky that night. Yeah. Let's uh let's fast forward a little bit because after your career as a major leaguer you went into the broadcast booth for a while for the Houston Astros, and then you uh, stepped into the dugout. And specifically, there's one, um, you know, you had you had great success in your uh, stint with the Houston Astros. I believe it was four out of the five seasons you were there, you had a winning record and made the playoffs. But I want to ask you specifically about something, Larry. I'd like to ask you, in in 1998 at the trade deadline, you guys acquire Randy Johnson for Freddie yeah. Garcia, Carlos Guillen, and John Halama. Randy Johnson has 11 starts with you guys, goes 10 and 1 with an ERA of 1.28, 116 strikeouts in 84 and a third innings with four shutouts. What did acquiring that kind of an arm and that kind of a player? do for you guys as a team? Well, it you know, it electrified the city, um, both because of the quality of his work and just his persona. You know, being six foot ten with that, you know, long hair flying and, and you know, the, the sure. man just yeah. looking looking helpless. Uh, you know, I think yeah. he sold out every game that he pitched. And and yet again, you know, it, it's it's that a story in baseball that it's never going to be easy because I think I, I didn't think it was going to be easy, but I, I just assumed that we would probably beat the Padres in the first round and then play the Braves. And I didn't know what would happen with that. Uh, and as it turned out, Kevin Brown uh, looked more like Nolan Ryan in the, in the first game against Randy and he struck out 16 yeah. guys in eight innings. The only way we got a run was off Trevor Hoffman in the ninth inning. And so Kevin Brown just rose to the occasion and beat Randy Johnson. So then we had a TV day or a day off because of TV. And then we played the next day in Houston and won. And then we went to San Diego and had another day off because of TV. And then the next day, Kevin Brown pitched again. So that's one thing that, uh, that I, well, it disappoints me. I'll, I'll put it this way. I understand that when you're in business, you have to make money. And I understand that if the TV networks are going to pay a lot of money for the rights to show the games, that they could insist on when the games are played. But uh, what the, the actual effect of that uh, on the teams that are in the playoffs is that if you're playing teams on the West Coast, you have to start the games in the twilight. And that's sure. what happened to us in San Diego. And I just thought, you know, after 162 games plus six weeks of spring training and all the work we've done to get into the playoffs, we're one and one and we go out here in San Diego and we play two games where the hitters can't see very well for the first five innings. And it just was really disappointing. But then last year when the Astros, uh, beat the Dodgers and won the World Series, they were having to play those games in the twilight too. And they won a couple of them. And so uh, what I realized is that, you know, what was really kind of grinding on me for all those years about, you know, the team we had, it was so great with Randy and, 
and you know, Bagwell Biggio and Hello, just a host of great players um, that we, you know, I felt like it just wasn't a fair series because of playing in the twilight. But then last year when the Astros won it, I thought it was perfectly fair because they won a couple of those games. So, you know, your success is going to affect your your viewpoint on things like that. And uh, so they finally got over the hump last year, and it looks like they might be able to uh, get back in the playoffs again this year. And I, I could say this uh, without hesitation. I would like to have been a starting pitcher for the teams I managed with the offense and defense we had. And I would like to be a starting pitcher with this team they have now with the offense they have and the kind of feeling they have. So a lot of times for a pitcher, uh, the team he has around him makes a a big difference in in what his loss record is. And that's what we were talking about earlier with with Nolan Ryan is that he he never really played for teams that scored a lot of runs and he still won 320-something games and had an ERA, I think, below – three and and, you know everything that he did was that much more remarkable because he never played for the Baltimore Orioles for example or the Oakland A's or the Big Red Machine or uh, some of those Braves teams in the late 70s or late 60s early 70s he was always playing for teams with puny offense so you know uh, we don't very well they do now I mean back then you had no choice about who you played for. But now you can become a free agent and then you can look at all the teams or that might be interested in you and you can try to go to a team that has good hitting and fielding and, and that can help you win more games. But uh, back then when, when no one was playing, although he lasted past the time when you could become a free agent and he did that uh, twice, but in the, you know, up until about 78 or nine, uh, players just had to play with the team they were on or else quit baseball. There was no choice to bargain with any other team. Sure. Uh, we have somebody else that called in. Would you like to take a call, Larry? If I can hear it, my hearing's not too good. Okay, let's let's go to the line. Caller, you are on the air live with Larry Durker. Go ahead. First of all, this is Jimmy, and I'm calling from Tampa, Florida. I've got to be the world's biggest Astros fan, and for you to put me on with with what I consider one of the greatest managers is is really a treat. So, Mr. Durker, thank you for doing this, and and thank you for having me uh, be able to ask questions on the program. Oh, you're welcome, Jimmy. I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, sir. Listen, I'm going to ask you a caveat in your career. Uh, There was a time in 2000 when Dwight Gooden was a Houston Astro for about four innings and he actually is from my hometown here in Tampa Florida I've met him a couple of times and I got a chance to talk to him a lot of people don't remember Dwight Gooden as a Houston Astro can you tell me a little bit about what that was because and what that was like because when I talked to him he said one of the reasons that you had the seizure is because you guys used to do a lot of cocaine and blow together and when that happened you shut yourself (laughs) in the dugout so talk to me about Dwight Gooden coach thank you well no that's uh you know there were in the early 1980s that was um after my time as a pitcher i wasn't uh, involved in any of that but i know he got involved in some of it and and uh oddly enough uh uh when he was doing all those things with the Mets, uh they were they were talking about him uh, breaking all of Nolan Ryan's records and going straight to the Hall of Fame. And after that one year when he went about 25 and 6 and, and had a 158 ERA, uh, it was never that easy for him anymore. And that year, uh, uh, you know, it was like magic. He'd throw the ball and hop out over everybody's bat, like I was talking about earlier, and he had that curveball that the guys couldn't track. And uh, he's, he, I think he pitched in the all-star game his rookie year, struck out three guys in an inning. And it looked like he would be the greatest pitcher of all time. But, uh, you know, you have to last a really long time for that to happen. And uh, with him, the next year was uh, 86, which was the year the Astros played the Mets in the playoffs. And he had a really good year that year. He won 18 or 20 games, but he lost, you know, maybe – 
12 or 13, and somehow or other, he was throwing just, uh, the, his velocity was about the same, 96, 95, 96, 97, as it was the year before. But hitters were starting to square up his fastball. And it, it now knowing what I know about analytics, it, it really has to do with how many revolutions the ball makes on the way to home plate, how fast it spins. And it looked to me like he got a little bigger and stronger, um, you know, he still looked athletic, but he didn't seem as willowy. And and I think even though he's throwing his hard, he didn't have the effect on that hitter of looking like the ball hops over your bat at the last minute. And so he had to hit corners, and he had to throw his curveball when he was behind in the count, and he had to do all of the things that almost every other pitcher has to do to pitch at that level, and he did it. And he had a really good season. And I think the first game of the playoffs, he got beat one to nothing by Mike Scott. It was kind of like uh, the, the year that uh, Kevin Brown beat Randy Johnson. Um, yeah. And so yeah. from that point on, you know, I think he was not an ordinary pitcher, but he was just a very good pitcher. And I don't think True. Nolan really ever lost that backspin, even up into a time when he was over 40 years old. So you don't know what it is going to come to pass. I think that uh, Doc Gooden got caught in the New York life, 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 life and all that, you know, stuff, and that probably had a negative sure. effect on his career. He still had a great career, but you know, one of the things that the people talked about or do talk about in Houston is is Jose Altuve and Craig Biggio, because it appears that uh, Altuve may have surpassed Biggio's records in some areas. And uh, maybe there has even been talk that he's not that far behind the pace that Pete Rose was on. But then this year he hurt his knee and he was out for a month. So he's 26 or 7. You know, for him to get 3,000 hits, he's going to have to stay healthy. And, to you know, to even think about, you know, passing 3,000 and going towards 4,000 in the Rose territory, you know, he'd have to almost stay healthy for 20 more years and, and – well, not 20, but maybe 10 or 15 more years and, and get almost 200 hits every year. So longevity and, and health, uh, durability, all of those things, uh, in addition to rare ability, are, are the things that make Hall of Famers. And so to try to predict Altuve at this stage doing what Biggio was able to do or for trying to say that Doc Gooden was going to be go by all Nolan Ryan's records, it, it's really probably unlikely those things will happen, even though at at the time it seems like they will. Absolutely, Mr. Durker, we have run out of time. I could I could spend the next two hours listening to you share anecdotes and stories and the state of the game and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going to let you go. I cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast and taking the questions and just being willing to come on. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you very much, and I hope to have you on again in the future. All right. Well, you're welcome. Uh, thanks for promoting baseball. Thank you. For, thank you very much, Larry. Have a good day. You too. Bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was former major league manager and pitcher Larry Durker. As Larry said, he did throw a no-hitter in 1976. I do ask that in the future, if you do call in, please make sure you are respectful of our guests as they are giving of their time. Some guests are willing to talk about certain things, and some guests are not willing to talk about certain things, and we need to make sure that we are being respectful to all of the former baseball players that we do have on the program. That's it for this episode. I have another episode airing Sunday. It'll be with Jim Allen again, and we will talk about the inequalities that pre-1980 baseball players face today in terms of not getting pensions and whatnot. It should be a fascinating hour of baseball. Stay tuned. Find me on Twitter at Devlin under slash Clark 84. This episode will be uploaded to iTunes. You can find it on there. Please leave us five stars and a review. Tell all your friends about it. Thank you so very much for joining me on this hour-long edition, and we'll see you down the road in podcast land. <laughs>